I'm now going to introduce an alternate way of solving differential equations using what's called Laplace transforms. Using a Laplace transform, I can take a differential equation and transform it into basically an algebraic equation that we can solve using our traditional algebra techniques. There are a lot of different transformations we can do. A Fourier transform is one that I've used a lot as an electrical engineer. That's going from the time domain into the frequency domain. With the Laplace transformation, however, we're going to go from the time domain into what's called the S domain. We will be able to solve for things a little bit easier in the S domain, and then we transform it back to the time domain. Here's a list of a lot of different transform methods. Again, we have the Fourier transform, there's something called the Fourier sine and cosine transforms, two-sided Laplace, but what we'll be doing is the Laplace transform. To talk about the Laplace transform, let me introduce some notation. This fancy L and then curly braces and then our function such as f of t. So what goes inside the curly braces is our function in the time domain. This is going to equal capital F of S. Notice that we go from T to S and our notation goes from lowercase f to capital F. The capital letters designate a Laplace transform. To calculate the Laplace transform we're going to use a particular kernel and the kernel we're going to use for the Laplace transform is defined as the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative st times f of t dt. Notice this is a definite integral. That is, at the end we should have no t's because we're going to plug in 0 and infinity into our integration. Really because one of my limits of integration is infinity, this is more accurately described as an improper integral. So we will have to use some of our limit skills that we have from Calc 1. So looking at this, if you calculate a Laplace transform and you end up with a t still left in your function, then you know you've made a mistake because the result of this integration, because it is a definite integral, you should have no values for t. This is something you need to know for the exam. The part that is known as the kernel is the e to the negative st. If I go back to my list of integral transforms, you see under Laplace, the kernel, or k, is e to the negative, in this case they use ut, and the limits of integration are from 0 to infinity. If we looked at the two-sided Laplace transform, you'd see there was the same kernel, but in this case, the limits of integration are negative infinity to positive infinity. Likewise, if we looked at the Fourier transform, you'd see an entirely different kernel, and again, limits of negative infinity to infinity. So each one of these transforms is defined by two things, the kernel and the limits of integration. But for this class, we're only going to be using the Laplace transform, and this is the only kernel and integration limits that you need to know. I will definitely be asking one question on the exam that will be in the form of, find the Laplace transform of something by definition. And what I mean by that is you need to find the integration just like I have set up here. Let's do an example. Let's do the Laplace transform of the number 1. That seems pretty boring. Our f of t is just equal to 1. So my f of s is equal to the integration from 0 to infinity, e to the negative st times 1 dt. And when I do this integration, I'll remember my calc 2 skills, and I'll rewrite this as the limit as b approaches infinity of the integration from 0 to b of e to the negative st dt. And this is equal to the limit as b approaches infinity of negative 1 over s e to the negative st evaluated at b and 0. And this is equal to the limit as b approaches infinity of negative 1 over s e to the negative st plus 1 over s e to the 0. When I let b go to infinity, e to the negative infinity is simply equal to 0. And the second term is just equal to 1 over s. So the Laplace transform of 1 is simply 1 over s. However, I am going to have to make one stipulation. This is only true when s is greater than 0. If s was less than 0, then the limit as b goes to infinity would actually be e to the positive infinity, which would blow up. So Laplace transforms are defined for specific values for s. In this case, it's pretty straightforward. S simply has to be positive, 
but we're always going to have to pay attention to the acceptable values for s in order for the Laplace transform to converge. If the Laplace transform does not converge, there is no Laplace transform possible to find. Now let's find the Laplace transform of e to the negative at. Let's go ahead and set up the definition again. Again, that's the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative st, that's our kernel, times our f of t, which is e to the negative at all dt. Now we're going to use exponent rules to combine this, and then we'll do the integration. And as b goes to infinity, the term e to the negative s plus a to the b power goes to zero, and we're left with one over s plus a. Again, we're going to have to take care of when this is true. We need s plus a now to be greater than zero, because if it was negative, then a negative negative would be positive, and then this would go to positive infinity and would not exist. So the Laplace transform of e to the negative a t is equal to 1 over s plus a, as long as s plus a is greater than 0. Let's do one more example, this time the Laplace transform of t. Again, we don't really know why I'm doing this. Where we're going to go with this is taking an entire differential equation, finding the Laplace transform of both sides, solving it algebraically, and then transforming it back into the time domain. But right now the first step is how to translate the time domain into the s domain, and that's what we're working on right now. So to do this we're going to have to integrate by parts. Now that we've set up our u and v, we'll go ahead and integrate, and the next step would bring us to this, and we're going to have to use L'Hopital's rule on the first term. And the second term we've done before, and it looks like the first term actually goes to zero as b goes to infinity, and what's left over of the second term is simply 1 over s squared. So that means the Laplace transform of t is simply 1 over s squared. Again, we're going to say s has to be positive in order for the improper integral to converge. All right, we're going to do two more examples. The first one is with sine. If we're trying to find the Laplace transform is something like sine to the 2t. We do the same thing we've done before. And what we're going to actually have to do is integrate by parts twice. When I do this, I'll get, and now I'm going to get a little sloppy with my improper integrals, and I'm going to say I know with the left hand side, as long as s is positive, then e to the negative infinity goes to zero, so I end up with, and since sine of zero is zero, that first term is just equal to zero. Let's look at the second term, and I'll need to integrate by parts again, and again simplifying, it would have seemed that it would seem that we're getting absolutely nowhere, we're back where we started. Well actually, if we're back where we started, we can set pieces of both sides equal to each other. So I know the left hand side is equal to the Laplace transform of sine of 2t, because that's what we were trying to solve. And on the right hand side, I can take that bit with the integration symbol and say, well that's actually, again, the Laplace transform of sine of 2t. Now all I need to do is solve for the Laplace transform of sine of 2t. And when I do that, and if I go ahead and multiply that out, I find that the Laplace transform of sine of 2t is equal to 2 over sine squared plus 4. So this one involved using a trick, doing integration by parts twice, and then realizing that we came up with the same integration that we were trying to solve for, and then we were able to combine those two and find the solution for the Laplace transform. Now I want to talk about another function called the Heaviside function. We're actually going to be using this quite a bit when we're talking about Laplace transforms. The Heaviside function looks like this. It's off, or zero, until time a, at which point it turns on to one. If we had a heavy side function that started right at zero, simply use u of t. So this is a piecewise function, and if I wanted to write this out, I would say that u of t minus a is zero when t is less than a, and it's equal to one when t is greater than or equal to a. So we could find the Laplace transform of this. Since this is a piecewise function, we're going to set this up as zero to a, and then a to infinity. And from zero to a, the function is equal to zero, so it's simply zero, and then we're going to integrate from a to infinity for e to the negative st times 1 dt, and that's simply equal to this, 
which is, as we found before, 0, and then e to the negative a s. So the Laplace transform of u t minus a is equal to 1 over s e to the negative a s. Again, there should never be any t's when we're done with our Laplace transform. It goes completely from the time domain into the s domain. If you still have a t left over, you've done something incorrectly. On the exam, I'm going to have you do one Laplace transform by definition. And to be honest, it's probably going to be one that involves a piecewise function. But in general, when we're trying to find Laplace transforms, we're going to use a table of Laplace transforms, because if I were tomorrow to figure out what the Laplace transform of sine of 2t is, it's still going to be equal to the same thing. It would be pretty tedious if we'd have to use the definition each time we were trying to find a Laplace transformation. I'll be giving you a table of Laplace transforms on the exam. One such item on the transform list will be the Laplace transform of t to the n is equal to n factorial divided by s to the n plus 1. n factorial is simply n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down to 1. So 3 factorial, for instance, is 3 times 2 times 1, or 6. So if I asked you to find the Laplace transform of t, which is one that we already calculated, that would be 1 factorial divided by s to the n plus 1 factorial. That would be 1 factorial divided by s to the 1 plus 1, or 1 over s squared, which is exactly what we found before. The Laplace transform of t to the third power would be 3 factorial divided by s to the 3 plus 1, or 6 over s to the fourth. In order to use transform tables, we need to know a couple of properties. Laplace transforms are linear. That is, if I have the Laplace transform of a function times a constant, I can pull out that constant and then simply look at the Laplace transform of the function. That makes sense if we remember what the definition of the Laplace transform was. Since our integration is also linear, we know we can just pull out that c and calculate the integration without it. In addition, the Laplace transform of the sum of two functions is simply equal to the Laplace transforms of the functions added together. And just to be clear, the Laplace transform of f of t times g of t is not equal to the Laplace transform of f of t times the Laplace transform of g of t. Not all functions have Laplace transforms. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this but I'm going to say something like e to the t squared does not have a Laplace transform. The key is whether or not the function is of exponential order. A way to test to see if something is of exponential order is to take the limit as t goes in to infinity of f of t divided by e to the c t. If the limit exists, then f of t is of exponential order. If we looked at e to the t squared, we would see that as the limit goes to infinity, this also goes to infinity. So that means that e to the t squared is not of exponential order. But most of the examples we'll be doing will be of exponential order, and we will be able to find the Laplace transform.